Welcome to the Voices of War, a podcast with a simple vision, to bring to life the true costs of war through the voices of those who've lived it. I'm your host, Maz, and I hope you enjoy this episode. My guest today is Adam Cooper. He is the Director of Digital Conflict for the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, or HD. For those not familiar with the organization, HD mediates between governments, non-state armed groups, and opposition parties to reduce conflict, limit the human suffering caused by war, and develop opportunities for peaceful settlements. Adam has been with HD for over a decade and oversees a global program of work mediating offensive cyber operations and disinformation on social media. He also hosts The Mediator Studio, a podcast that provides some incredible insights into what happens behind closed doors when peace agreements are negotiated. Prior to his current role, Adam managed HD's Myanmar operations, and before joining HD, he coordinated election observation missions in Asia and served as an advisor to former Moldavian President Mohammed Nasheed. He has degrees from Oxford University and the Harvard Kennedy School. Adam is a Thai and UK national and currently lives in Brussels. Adam, thanks for joining me on the podcast. Great to be with you, Maz. So, Adam, before we dive into your work with HD, which is quite extensive, maybe let's get a better sense of uh, how you ended up doing the work that you do. What uh, what motivated your journey into the world, maybe murky world, uh, of conflict mediation? You know, really by accident, Maz, a lot of people um, who work for HD almost fall into it. And, and that was certainly the case for me. Um, and looking back, I guess there were a few turning points in my life. Uh, in my life. And, and uh, you know, I grew up having a pretty sheltered existence uh, in London and uh, was in Thailand uh, at the time that the 2004 tsunami happened and was kind right. of personally caught up and affected there. And that really is what took me away from a life in the UK to, to a life um, in the developing world. And because of what had happened to, to, to me personally and what I saw around me, um, I volunteered for the UN on tsunami relief in the Maldives. And then from there, um, got drawn into the interesting political world of Asia um, and ended up working for uh, the uh, democratic opposition uh, in the Maldives. And it was really then that I kind of got a sense of the high political stakes that are involved in other parts of the world. You know, you grow up in the UK, it's very comfortable. Mm. Yes, we have fierce political discussions, but, but, you know, you take that stability for granted. And then I was in a place like the Maldives, which was really at that time, you know, struggling through a very difficult democratic transition where you would see, you know, members of the opposition being beaten in the street, and then you realize what's at stake. So that's Mm -hmm. what kind of drew me into, to kind of politics um, outside the Western world. And then from there, there were a few steps um, in between uh, until I ended up in the mediation world. Mm. That's interesting. I mean, the, I just want to pick up on what you mentioned about you know, the tsunami that happened to you personally. Can you just talk about that a little bit? So you you were actually there when it occurred. Yeah, and and you know the island which I was on was not one of those which is sort of most hard hit compared to the sort of dramatic images that you saw on TV. But I was actually out um, diving uh, with my mm. brother at the time, and and so we were out at sea. Um, and then uh, as the boat came back, we, we just saw kind of a scene of devastation and, and mm. wreckage on, on the edge of the island. And, and it was just extremely confusing. And you had no idea how, how this had happened. You know, no one really imagines a, a tsunami. You didn't see any storm. And, and suddenly mm. you come back and there's, there's no jetty and we're sort of swimming to the shore. Um, wow. And, you know, my parents had kind of run away from the beach and, and, and they and were there. Undoubtedly and, freaking and, out about you, you and your brother, undoubtedly. Yeah, exactly. They had no idea where we were. And, and so, you know, and, and when, once I, I guess I saw that up close, um, yeah, I, 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 was, I had just left university and I thought, okay, helping with this is clearly going to be a better use of my time than whatever else I had planned. So um, I was fortunate enough to, that uh, the humanitarian agency in, in the UN, OCHA, was open to me kind of volunteering and, and lending um, some help to the relief operation. And, and that's what really kind of gave me my first taste of international affairs. With that sort of work. And then, uh, of course, uh, working for the first democratically elected president uh, of the Maldives, uh, Mohammed Nasheed. What was that like? 
Oh, it was great. I mean, <laughs> I suspect you were, you, I mean, that's for a, and, and to be quite honest at the time, a uh, relatively young and, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm sure eager and keen, uh, Adam, uh, but I suspect that would have been quite a, you know, quite a big step up, I imagine. I mean, eager, keen, and enti- entirely unqualified, right? <laughs> so, you know, we... Well, it's politics, I, I met, right? <laughs> yeah, well, the, you know, I remember the first time I, I met him for a, for a cup of tea, you know, he was under house arrest at the time. And, um, you know, we, we were just chatting and at the end of the conversation, he said, well, how would you like to leave the UN and come and work for the party and for me? And I said... Oh, that sounds really interesting, but you do realize I have like zero political experience. Like I have almost nothing that I can bring to you. And he said, oh, he said, it's fine. You know, we're all wor- working it out as we go along. Just come and join us and we'll go on that journey together. <laughs> and, and I'm glad I did take that jump because, mm. you know, it, it wasn't really like a normal job. Obviously, it was sort of mm. you were working for a, a cause that you believed in deeply. And, and, you know, you saw colleagues who were making really incredible sacrifices, right, who were out there on the streets and, and facing quite a degree of harassment you know our offices were attacked and it, it, it was you you had a sense of the 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 real stakes involved mm-hmm. um and just to be allowed into that world and to help in whatever modest way that i could you know age 22 um it that was a real privilege and and definitely put i guess the fire in my belly for sort of politics in asia for sure yeah yeah that's a Congratulations. I mean, that's a, I guess a, 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 it's circumstantial, but also, uh, you know, I believe we also make our luck and uh, we use the opportunities that are given to us. Uh, but you also, so you're dual citizen, uh, Thai and UK. Um, what's your link to Thailand? Have you lived there? Were you just there on a holiday, as you mentioned? Was that the only kind of uh, experience you have with Thai or had you lived there and, and, and uh, spent uh, longer? Yeah, so my mother's Thai, and I, I grew up mm-hmm. in London, and but we would go and visit every year, and and you know I, I guess I had some. Um, what it did do, I think, was just sort of open my eyes from a pretty young age to a very different culture, right? Mm-hmm. And 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 I think being sort of um, you know spanning those two worlds in in the West and Asia perhaps is is one of the reasons why I've kind of ended up in mediation, right? Because mm. friends friends tell me that when I speak in Thai, that I sound like an entirely different person, like my tone of voice. Yeah. And I think you just kind of learn how to communicate in a, in a really different way. And and you end up, I think, having to build empathy with with people from kind of different cultures. And that's a really important skill set, I think, when you when you come to the mm. mediation world as well. So I wasn't deeply rooted in Thailand. I had family there. Um, but my Thai wasn't especially fluent. Mm. So it took some time later on in life to kind of get immersed there back in Bangkok. And, and uh, But it definitely, I guess the seeds were sown quite early for me, um, being able to kind of work between different worlds. Yeah, I really like that term, different worlds. I mean, I often refer to it as, you know, walking in two worlds. And that's the kind of multitude of identities that one embodies, right? Uh, having lived in different parts of the world spoken lived in different languages uh, and this is something I, I often talk about uh with you know in some of the courses that i teach is is that very point you know it's the when i speak in bosnian uh, it's different pace different tone my my body sure. language is different uh you know the yeah. entire the ad- identity is embodied very differently to when i'm uh, engaging in English, uh, well, that makes that makes absolute sense. And then, of course, uh, your path and journey to HD is is a natural one. Uh, although I must say, most people probably won't know, won't have heard of HD, uh, and that's probably the way HD likes it, uh, knowing hmm. what the organisation does. Uh, but maybe you can, uh, you know, kind of give us some wave tops uh, about what the organisation actually does and how it does it. Sure. Well, it was set up about. 20 years ago in a little house uh, on the edge of the lake in Geneva. And the rationale for the organization's creation was that the world of mediation, you know, working between governments and and armed groups um, had been dominated by the UN and by a, a certain set of governments who would do this work. And, you know, essentially what HD tried to do was to create the world of private diplomacy. And we weren't the only organization who, who were in that space. But I think, you know, we've, there was, our founder saw that there was um, 
for want of a better term, gap in the market, right? Because you'd have these internal conflicts often where it might have been difficult for larger, more formal institutions to operate, you know, states who might not want the UN involved. And so there was a space for a more informal and uh, especially a, a, an organization that, that, that really focuses on confidentiality like mm. HD. So that's how, that's why the organization started and kind of the first exercise in mediation that we did was in Indonesia, in Aceh, the, the first cessation of hostilities between the free Aceh movement, the rebels there, and the government of Indonesia. And now it's grown into a, a quite large organization, sort of working in 30 countries around the world and a few hundred staff. Mm. And, and, and we've got you know, many kind of confidential dialogue processes in, in most wars and conflicts that you'll read about mm. in the news. And as you said, a lot of that is kind of kept low key for a good reason uh because of the obvious sensitivities um and uh maybe and can some I just, of it uh, is more public as well sure go ahead can i just double click on that uh, just really quickly because i think it, it, it while it might be obvious why it's kept confidential it might not be so to everyone can you just uh can you just elaborate on that a little bit why it's so important for hd to remain kind of in the shadows quote unquote yeah, I mean, I, I think it's often what our clients, i.e. the people who are at war with each other, demand. Mm. Because especially in the early stages of a process, you know, if you put yourself in the shoes of, say, a, a government official who sees that a conflict's going on, is maybe unsure that a, a sort of military-only solution is going to, to lead to a good outcome for them, is curious about what a negotiated settlement might look like that's a risky thing for that government official to to engage in right and so you know if they're going to take that those first baby steps to finding out what an alternative to a military solution looks like they want that to be discreet and mm. sometimes they'll do that themselves right without any mediation at all but often it can be really helpful to kind of grease the wheels through a third party because it just allows someone to shuttle quietly and you know float ideas with the other side in a deniable manner and that protects that official from any consequences from which might come from from even being seen to entertain peace which is not always the most popular option in um in a government so that's the reason why why it often exists and then i think for the you know, discussions themselves, you know, people really want to feel that they can test ideas in a manner which um, is non-committal. Um, mm. And then, you know, they may take that up in a, in a more formal process, either through us or maybe through other bodies like the UN. But we, it allows them to experiment a little more freely. Yeah. So in these kind of uh, uh, diplomacy kind of tracks, where track one is the official one, the one that we see on TV, right? That's the formal signatures, leaders of uh, conflict parties shaking hands, etc. Then there's the kind of track two, if I understand this correctly, track two is the unofficial academic civil society. Uh, and then, of course, track three is the actual people-to-people -people diplomacy. Where does HD sit in that space? Then it's probably somewhere in the kind of between two and three or, or between one and two, it's some ways kind of dances around various tracks, I, I suspect. Yeah, you know, it, 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 it does, exactly. And I, I think as, uh, as the organization has grown over time, we, we've spanned that full breadth um, mm. between sometimes, you know, convening processes with serving government officials. So, you know, they might be coming in a, uh, in a sort of informal capacity, but but they're very much serving, and that's sort of fairly close to a track one setup. And sometimes you're working with experts who are close to their respective governments and trusted by them in a more track two setting. And sometimes, indeed, it's kind of work that's at a community level. You know, for example, some of the local agreements we've mm -hmm. forged in Nigeria uh, between different communities who've had tensions with each other and that's kind of more grassroots community-based work uh closer to the kind of track three description which you provide mm -hmm. so it's really very much dependent on on the context and the needs and whatever we think is is most useful um and where the kind of mediation gaps to be filled are but i think one of the the good things about the organization is that we're increasingly able to span those different tracks uh, 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 um 
in one conflict. So to take Libya as an example, mm -hmm. you know, uh, several years ago, the, the UN envoy there, Hassan Salameh, had said, okay, you know, I'm going to handle a lot of the, the top level outreach to the political leaders. Can you run a national consultation process with, with people more at, um, in the level of towns and, and, and rural communities? And that's what we did to feed into that higher level process. But at the same time, you know, last year um, in Switzerland, we also helped to bring together some of those top leaders mm. to kind of lay the foundations for a ceasefire and, and political roadmap that, that then was picked up by the UN and others later. So when we invest heavily in a place, often we're, we're spanning and, and, and able to, to reach both to the communities who are most affected mm -hmm. by the conflict, but also to the leaders of, of the conflict parties themselves too. Yeah, I mean, it's a absolutely incredible work and I think quite humbling work. Uh, and it has, it's amazing. Uh, and I followed your podcast closely and, and, and we can maybe touch on it a little bit as well, but I think you've, you've, actually, uh, you've actually interviewed Hassan Salome on there, if I remember correctly. Uh, but one of the things that I find amazing yeah, is the disproportionate impact, you know, one, two, three, five, ten people can have uh, to build those initial bridges that are very tenuous to start with, but over time become more dense uh, to, to build the, the the hope, I guess, in one way, but also build the the confidence of the conflicting parties uh, to actually embrace this idea of peace. Uh, but I guess the conflict has to be quote unquote ripe enough to get to that point. Um, what are some of the lessons about that process that you can maybe uh, pull out from the various high-level negotiators and mediators that you've interviewed on uh, the, the mediator studio, which which I'll, I'll put a link to, uh, and I highly recommend the podcast. Uh, but what are some of the key lessons that you've uh, taken out from talking to these people? Yeah, I think a few things have jumped out for me um, of the interviews that I've conducted. And you know, the first thing is at the risk of stating the obvious is – the willingness of, of the mediator and negotiator to take calculated risk hmm. and to do things which are politically difficult. So I think of uh, Betty Bagombe, for example, this kind of amazing uh, Ugandan, uh, she was minister at the time in the government, and you know she was advocating for um, quiet outreach to Joseph Kony, the head of the Lord's hmm. Resistance Army, hmm. right? Hmm. Sort of, <laughs> you know, this kind of, wasn't figure, he like the most could, wanted uh, man in Africa? You know, exactly. Yeah, and, and you yeah. know, and the, the, he 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 had sent her death threats. You know, he didn't make the it easy to advocate for for negotiating. Um, but that's what she did because she very much strongly believed that this would be at least one avenue that should be pursued in ending this this very brutal war, uh, and remarkably kind of built up a, a degree of trust with him and dealt with some kind of, and, and she talks about this, frankly, in the interview, dealt with some really difficult conversations she mm. had with her own president about, about that dialogue process. You really get a sense of like the, the early on in a process, it takes brave people mm. to, to dare to explore a peaceful settlement. The other thing which I think comes out is people knowing at what point you need to keep a process confidential and at what point you need to broaden outreach to the public at large or particular constituencies. So this really comes out in, in the interviews that I've done on the Colombian peace process, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you, you have the kind of Norwegian facilitator uh, talking about uh, sort of secret helicopter trips that he's doing under cover of the Red Cross in order to bring the FARC rebel group to, mm. to discussions with, uh, with the Colombian government. And, and there, absolutely, you know, there's no other way to do that unless it's kept incredibly close hold, right? Because if it, get, if it becomes public, it just prompts sort of a backlash and, 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 uh, and the talks, you know, stop dead in their tracks. But then, you know, much later on in the process, once it had, had matured and ripened, as you say, you know, then there was really an extensive effort to, to reach out to, to different constituency mm -hmm. groups, particularly victims of the conflict. You know, the Columbians are, are very proud of like how they, they brought them into the negotiation room, brought their voices in and, and listened to them seriously in, in more than mm -hmm. just a kind of tokenistic way. And even then the process faced problems because it, there was a, the peace agreement was put to a referendum and, and, and that was rejected at first. And so 
you, you really begin to sort of appreciate that peace is made in, in stages, right? Mm. And, and that there might be a certain point of it where it's going to be a, a small number of people in the room. But at a certain point, given that it's about communities, given it's mm. about the shape of your country, there's a point at which you do need to kind of secure the legitimacy um, from, a broader, uh, from a broader group than just the people in the room. Amazing answer. I love it for a number of uh, uh, reasons. And the thing that stands out to me the most is the sentence, peace is made. I love that because that goes against these common narratives of we need to go to war, we need to fight a war, we need to win the war to get peace, as though peace somehow mysteriously emerges after war. Uh, that's not that's not how it happens. Uh, peace is built by people who are in the shadows who recognize that at some point we need to stop killing each other. But I also find that there's a, there's then the risk of being seen, whether domestically or internationally, as speaking to the enemy. And we know this very well from the West. We don't negotiate with terrorists, which I find such a perplexing narrative to embrace. A, it's wrong. Uh, because we ultimately end up doing it, as we're seeing in Afghanistan right now. <laughs> exactly. But B, it, set, it, it sets us up for, for the scenario of Afghanistan, where we haven't spoken to those who we're trying to shape and influence. Uh, and we find ourselves in a situation where, and I think you know, your executive director, David Harlan, put out a really poignant opinion piece recently on the current Afghanistan crisis, how that's a perfect example of how negotiations are not to be done. We, we kind of touched on this offline, but uh, what, what are your thoughts on the current situation in, in that context and in, in what you just said? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to be, um, especially not being an Afghanistan expert, uh, sort of add my voice to, to the flood of commentary that's mm. going on um, at the moment and, and claim any an expertise there. But what I would say um is something about the the broader mediation and negotiation lessons, which um, our director touched on in that piece that that you mentioned, which he entitled a, a sort of how a lesson in how not to negotiate. Because I think if you if you look at the the um, all the debate that's going on right now around sort of what went wrong in Afghanistan, surprisingly little of it is focused on mm. the negotiation and mediation questions. Right. And to the extent that it is, it generally is focused on the ideas of, of we did, um, the US did a dodgy deal with the Taliban recently. And that's one of the reasons why we're in this mess. But there's relatively little attempt, uh, at least in the sort of mainstream media, to reflect on the mistakes that were made a little before that. Right. And in particular, sort of in the aftermath of, of, um, of the sort of U.S. bombing campaign in in two thousand and one, when when the the Taliban was at its weakest, and you know you had the UN envoy uh, at the time, Lakta Brahimi, mm. organizing a, a lawyer jerga sort of conference of all the Afghans to determine the sort of future makeup of the country, and advocating for the Taliban to be included, um, and the the U.S. Uh, rejecting that, and and that just being you know, thinking that, you know, we're just going to pursue this on the battlefield and uh, and that'll be the end of that. We're not going to bring those with blood on their hands into a, a political process. Now, obviously, with the, with the benefit of hindsight, um, you know, that looks like a very rash decision now. But I, I think what's most important to those in the mediation community is that we reflect on that mistake. And, and not only with respect to Afghanistan, but mm. think about the other wars that are going on in the world at the moment, where arguably we're making the same mistake right now, right? I mean, you just look at the sort of um, the 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 counterinsurgency, counterterrorism operations which go on in in the Sahel and places like Mali at the moment, right? I mean, that has been tried for years, and I'm not sure. Again, I'm not a regional expert there, but uh, without a great deal of success, right? So you know, negotiating with um, with armed groups, specifically those of, of a jihadist mm. bent, is unpalatable for many. But but if nothing else, I really hope that this the tragedy of what's happening in Afghanistan mm. does make makes us question that, right? And makes us really think about what a, what a more effective diplomatic approach uh, might might have been. Yeah, and you can't you can't bomb yourself to peace. I mean, uh, this is one of the things that uh, again I explore at length in the podcast, and that's the action reaction component you can't 
fight against someone and expect through bombs that they will uh, change their view, that they will come to see the world as you'd like to see it. They may submit to your power for a time, uh, but you are not necessarily building a bridge or a common common language understanding to actually move forward, which is why this idea of, and especially if we think, there's just one example, if we had engaged with you know the Taliban back then, we would have been engaging with a far less radicalized Taliban than the Taliban that we're engaging with now. Uh, and, that's, and that's something we know as a fact. Uh, but maybe we can, uh, from here, uh, launch into an area where you certainly have a lot of experience or, or region, uh, and that's Myanmar, because you've spent uh, sure. six, seven years right in Myanmar yeah, as the right. head of the HD's operations there. Uh, conscious that you may not be able to talk about the in- intricate operational side of things, but perhaps you can give us an insight as to what was the work that you did and, of course, the uh, the outcome of, uh, of the work that you and the team did. Sure. Um, I mean, when I was there, it was at a very different time to the sort of tragic situation which you – um, see at the moment and and at that point you know when I started visiting the country and getting to know people there um, there was the very beginnings of this reform process that was led by by a former general um, who, who who became president Thein Sein and you know his ministers this was back in 2011 uh, were thinking seriously about okay how do we open up the country what should we be doing on the economy and how should we end you know some of the longest running civil wars in the world um and so my early experiences were talking to them and and uh and many of the armed group leaders about what the a negotiated process would look like because there had been some um ceasefires in in the past but none of them that were particularly successful and none of them that, that really tried to address the kind of political root causes of the mm. conflict. So you had this, this effort over a number of years by, by the government to, to take a different approach. Um, and however bad the situation is right now, I mean, you, you, you do have to, at least at that phase in, uh, in the country's development, you know, people were doing quite bold things. Um, mm. And so, you know, our rather modest role was really to kind of share some of our experiences uh, that we had had internationally, and and to just provide advice um, to armed group leaders, to the government, and to others who requested it on how to structure those negotiations, what they might cover, and so on. They did it themselves, Mass. Right? Mm-hmm. This was not, you know, even though HD is a kind of mediation organization, we were not mediating in Myanmar. It, it, it was their process. It was their show. We were just trying to assist on the margins a little, and and you know, you are reminded i think um of your own impotence in mm-hmm. in these situations as well and it, it it forces you to to be a little humble because of course you know there is the current crisis right now and and, and the undoing of so much of the progress that had been made but even before then as you well know you know we were faced with uh with the rohingya crisis which was unfolding you know while i was there in the country and and these are kind of forces which are so far beyond your control working for a small organization mm. and, and all you're really trying to do then is a kind of damage limitation exercise mm. actually right on, on preventing the sort of very worst outcomes and consequences and trying to open up channels that uh, between different communities to to mitigate the worst of it but but it was for me um a, a lesson in how the peaceful development of a country is is not a linear path at all mm. right you can kind of delude yourself while you're there into thinking it's you know you're you know chipping away at a problem and things will continue on a positive track uh but uh, but actually yeah the the country's recent experience proves otherwise so in that sense i i feel like it was an important lesson for me on on knowing kind of what you can and can't do mm. from an organization like hd and also, I guess the important lesson of when you absolutely have to step away, when you, when there's very little that can be done, when the conflict is raging and and and, and has a lot of fuel to burn yet, and that's kind of maybe even talking about that idea of you know conflict ripeness, uh, when mediation and the next stage is actually uh, can't even exist. I suppose it's just building the initial touches, right? Yeah, and you know, and that's a really fundamental and difficult question to answer, Maz, because it's almost impossible to know when you're yeah. there on the ground, like how um, 
whether your your presence is entirely useless or not, right? Because mm. what you do have to have, I think, in this work is a great deal of, of patience and be able to mm. sort of ride out the storms. And, and if I look at some of the work that, you know, my, my other colleagues have done um, in other parts of the world, there will be times when there'll be an uptick in, in violence and, uh, and they essentially can do no meaningful mediation work for several years at a time, right? But you maintain a sort of discreet and modest presence because that won't necessarily be forever, right? Mm -hmm. And you need to have those working relationships in place so that when circumstances do change, you're there to to try to encourage peace to the extent possible. So, um, you know, we we try to take the long view as an organization uh, Mm -hmm. and we're, we're lucky enough that we have sort of donors and supporters who who are willing to to kind of see it as a multi-year process and and acknowledge mm-hmm. that at times you know it's it's going to move backwards but that doesn't mean that it's kind of irretrievable right yeah. um it yeah. just means that you kind of change your approach and having those relationships while they may not bear fruit now because the circumstances of the broader environment is such that the time is not right having those relationships and that presence and being that trusted face over a longer period of time, uh, I, I suspect would be a huge strength of the organization. And I think particularly exactly. the fact that it's a private one, right? Because yes. it, it, and I think that's a point you, you, you really highlight at the start. You cannot be accused of bias or, you know, siding with, uh, you know, the US or the UK or China or any of the big major powers uh, because, you know, you are a privately funded organization that you have your fingers in, well, just about every pie, right? Um, for you personally, how did then, and, and maybe this is to do with Myanmar, um, was it Myanmar that because of the impact of technology that maybe I'll ask you to, to kind of elaborate on a little bit as well, uh, was that what ignited your passion for your current job, the digital conflict uh, piece, because I suspect a lot of my audience will know, but uh, maybe not everyone, uh, that you know social media had a huge impact in uh, Myanmar. Maybe you can touch on that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's become kind of the case study almost yeah. for how hate speech on 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 Facebook can can a better um, a sort of violent campaign and, and fuel it. Um, and you know the the fact that it was kind of so unrestrained online, seeing that firsthand uh, was deeply jarring. Um, and it does bring home, um, I think, what people who who kind of have studied this have known for a long time, which is that what happens online doesn't just live online, right? It has a very real impact on on people's lives. And in the worst case scenario, can 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 lead to more people dying. Um, and that is a sort of really obvious point, I suppose, to many people. But actually, what's hard to know is what you do about that problem, mm. right? So I think that sort of where where we were historically as a mediation community is is a really deep acknowledgement that this was a big problem, right? Mm. That mediators would see very often that the peace processes that they were involved in were being undermined by disinformation campaigns or kind of harassment of negotiators or mediators or but the response to it had not really been that well formulated. So that's the kind of weird world of mediation that I've stepped into now is to try to define what mm. that response means, what kind of agreements are possible, what should we be talking to social media platforms about, um, and and really trying it in the field, right, and, mm. and testing mm. what works and what doesn't because it's a fairly – new frontier and we, we've got to kind of got to get past the point from just sort of saying it's a problem to working out what solutions actually work yeah and what is and, and even defining the problem because it's so easy to say you know it's the algorithms sure uh, of course they are but that's also the business model uh so <laughs> you can't just turn a key and uh and and change it right absolutely and you know i i've been on i guess a digital education of sorts Matt, mm. right because you know, three years ago, when when we embarked on this as an organisation, um, you know, we we did not have really that deep expertise at all, and and had to turn to a lot of the experts in the field just to even understand when people talk about digital threats, what do they mean, right? And and that, for example, has led to us making a a fairly uh, clear distinction between 
you know, offensive cyber operations. Mm -hmm. So largely state sponsored, but not exclusively attacks into, for example, a country's critical infrastructure, right, mm -hmm. which is quite a sort of niche capacity. Mm -hmm. um, and um, a niche why? Because, it, because of the capabilities required? So you can suspect it's state-sponsored? Is that, is that what you mean? Yeah, ex exactly, right? The, the things that you would, I mean, you know, independent hacking groups and, and private individuals can achieve a certain amount themselves, but the things mm -hmm. that you really worry about, you know, being able to get into another country's water supply, for example. Yeah. Um, generally speaking, those people have to have some kind of backing and support from, from, a, from a government. And the number of governments who have those capabilities is rapidly growing, but still is, is comparatively small compared to the set of people who are able to cause harm online through social media, mm -hmm. which is, you know, the barriers to entry are much lower, right? So you can have, you know, pretty much anyone, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of organize uh, an information operation online. And, and, and you see that armed groups doing that. You see political parties doing that. Um, you see governments doing that, of course, and that's much more widespread as a problem. Mm. So, you know, part of part of um, of our job is just to into like get those different kinds of threats clear in our head, and then begin to come up with different solutions to to those problems. In particularly, to think about what kind of agreements on restraint are possible. Right? Can you negotiate with the government about what kinds of cyber attacks it will and won't conduct? Can you negotiate with people who are conducting information operations on social media to define the terms of what's acceptable and not, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think we have the definitive answers to, to those questions, but that's those are the questions we're asking ourselves now. And undoubtedly, I, I suspect it's a great focus of the organization given the ubiquitous nature of technology and, you know, that disinformation and misinformation find you in your pocket you don't have to go looking for it do you do that then where physical conflicts already exist uh, and you're basically the supporting effort to try and minimize i guess the uh, social media influencing any potential peace negotiations is that the kind of primary focus yeah, you, you do see that very much. And, and often it's, um, you know, the kind of online work and offline work mm -hmm. go, go hand right. in hand. Um, and you are most worried about what's happening online affecting things that are happening kind of in the real world, quote unquote. So mm -hmm. just to give you an example and make that a bit more real, you know, we, we've been looking quite closely at Libya, for example, mm -hmm. where people are really, you know, the UN's, experimented a lot with digital tools there we really try to invest heavily to understand um you know what's happening online and there you've seen really key points in political negotiations uh for example in the in the what they call the libya political dialogue forum so this body that was kind of tasked with coming up with a sort of roadmap and an inclusive government for the country there you know really sophisticated information operations being run to circulate fake agreements or to harass the mediator involved or to set up fake accounts impersonating the negotiators, right? Um, narrative laundering being done by, by certain governments to undermine the talk. So, you know, those are things which have a very concrete impact mm -hmm. on peace processes and, you know, working out okay what who's responsible for those things um can you come up with some limits on 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 their behavior and also what the social media platforms should be doing in a context like yeah. that because you know places like libya are not always kind of top of their intray shall we say um mm. and working out what what more they could be doing so that's kind of one example of where you know we we do see that it has a very real consequence and and we think that more can and should be done about that problem how do you deal with i mean i suspect particularly in this in the cyber domain you know the quote unquote gray zone warfare yeah when you have states who deny and will deny mm. any presence or any activities in cyber domain and i suspect in libya there would be a problem given the uh, the various uh, significant players that have um, you know, if not direct and certainly, you know, tertiary interests, how do you get them to the table? Because what stops them from saying, hey, we've got nothing to do with this. This is not yeah. us. This, you know, this. 
No, it's a question we get asked a lot, Maz, and it's a very good one. And it's one of the things that makes the job that um, I'm doing now, I guess, even more difficult than sort of the traditional forms of mediation, which we've done in the past. Because, of course, in any conflict, you know, you're going to have warring parties who say, that wasn't me, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But very clearly, what happens online, uh, they see it as sort of more deniable. Right. It's easier mm-hmm. for them to yeah. say it wasn't us. And, you know, ac- technical attribution has got a lot better over time. So it's harder for people to 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 deny it. But they still try to. Mm-hmm. Uh, absolutely. Right. And, and you're never going to have a kind of perfect insight into, you know, what's what's happening online and who's exactly waging that. So, yes, people feel that they have a little more wiggle room shall we yeah. say, and an and ability to kind of escape uh, accountability. And that makes mediation really hard. I think there's a few things that you can kind of do in response. And, and one technique is to focus more on future norms of behavior rather than um, past incidents, right? Because if you if you go to a government and kind of point the finger and and reference certain things that have happened in the past, you absolutely kind of open up that conversation to, you know, say that that wasn't me, that was someone else. Whereas if you're focused on, okay, we've identified a problem which you have and which your adversary has, we all agree that that's a problem we want to try to avoid in the future because this is a particular form of critical infrastructure which we regard as off-limits and this is something we're going to commit to in the future – that's a more plausible basis for for mediation exercise. And it's implicit that, okay, those things might have been done in the past, uh, but you're not you're not pointing at it directly. So um, I won't lie, it's really hard, Maz. Mm. And and there is not a, a, a deep evidence base yet, right? For yeah. what a kind of agreements work or not, but that's very much what we're trying to create. Yeah, you're building that uh that plan as it flies, so to speak, and and uh, in many ways, you're you're not only mediating at the point of conflict, <laughs> but you have to then mediate in the digital domain, which could be on the other side of the world. Yes, uh, and start building those, ne- you know, a much wider net of support uh, for that conflict, which makes it inevitably a lot more difficult. Another issue that I'm sure you get asked all the time as well, but it just jumps to mind is one of the things that if you're trying to shape the the I guess the narratives or the discourse on social media, I have no doubt that you are then therefore accused of some sort of censorship, uh, you know, yes. or at least uh, denying f- uh, free speech uh, of those who are, you know, using perhaps in their view the only medium they have, and that is social media, to have their voice heard. Um, how do you deal with those challenges? Because I'm sure you get them. You know, you're absolutely right. And, and, and we've seen this um, debate play out when we've tried to forge – uh, what we call social media peace agreements or codes mm. of conduct, right? And we tried to do that in uh, in Indonesia for the uh, local elections, working mm-hmm. together with an NGO there last year. We've tried it recently in Nigeria, um, forging a, uh, an agreement between three communities there. And, um, you know, those people who participate in those dialogues, they ask exactly this question. Right, like what? What? What are the limits, and 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 are we are we curbing that freedom of expression? What I would say to that is that, you know, I I think if you sort of look in the real world, um, not online, we generally accept that there are some limits to your freedom of mm. expression, mm. right? Um, and of course, this differs, but by, by by your whatever country you're you're in and and uh, and your culture, but you know those things which are explicit excitement incitement to violence, for example, right? Mm -hmm. As a society, generally, we consider that a bad thing, I think. So, um, you know, in that case, what agreements can do is really focus on, I guess, the the forms of speech which are most likely to lead to civilian harm, right? So if there's particular forms of hate speech or explicit calls for attacks on another group, I think we would say that that's that's beyond the limit of of what's considered kind of free expression. Mm. Um, the other side of it is to think about okay, what's the sort of not the content of what people are saying, but what's the behaviour online that we think is problematic. So, um, 
there, you know, to, to use the, the, the parlance that Facebook have, it's kind of coordinated inauthentic behavior, which is to say, if you're operating a large network of fake accounts, impersonating other people, trying to shape the narrative around something, I think, again, like most sort of the common sense views, uh, the common sense view of most people would be, that's not a good thing. Right, that 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 is that is not legitimate, and and we should work out ways of of um, of restricting that. So there, I think there's at least two ways where you can kind of begin to to draw some lines. But um, I agree, it's really hard, and you do need to f- make people feel that they have legitimate space to be able to express their view on a mm. conflict and criticize others without it descending into. Um, certain things which are, are are considered unacceptable. Yeah, yeah. And then again, the obvious question, and, and and you kind of touched on it already. But what role do the social media companies play in this? Because again, it is the business model is such that they thrive on on, on conf- not necessarily on conflict per se, but on uh, uh, you know. Well, maybe it is even conflict. It thrives on it because mm. that's what we share. You know, that's what we, you know, uh, in a time of crisis, that's what we go to. So what role do they play in it? There's certain algorithmic changes which you point to, Maz, which I think are really very hard to, to alter because, as you say, they're so, so fundamental to, to how the platforms operate. But there are other things which I think are are more feasible in terms of policy changes, which ourselves and others in the mediation community would like to see. And it starts Mm -hmm. with something really basic, which is just being more aware of the countries where social media is undermining peace processes. Mm -hmm. Um, Because the sorts of countries which we operate in are not really the sorts of countries which the social media platforms currently invest that much resources Mm -hmm. and, and attention into, right? And if you look at sort of structurally how how they're set up, you know they'll they'll sit down on on elections, say, right, at mm-hmm. the beginning of each year, and you know they have a a, a formula which they'll use to, to gauge, okay, what's the risk level of this election? How bad could social media undermine it? And we'll sort of invest some company resources in trying to prevent that in response to that calculation. Mm-hmm. Now, our view is that um, that's important, but not enough. Right. And we should be as aware of peace talks that are going on. Right. So the mm. Libya example that I gave is is a good one because, you know, the way the, the platforms are set up at the moment, those things are not systematically entering into their risk assessment. Right. Mm. So they're not sitting. Mm. There is nobody currently in the social media companies who's looking at peace talks that are going on around the world and thinking, where where could my platform undermine them? That should change. Um, mm. And that's a conversation which we and others are trying to have with them. Right. Because I suspect that's a, that would be a, a, a difficult conversation to have. And I think governments, I think in Australia in particular, has been quite vocal, particularly with Facebook, you know, over the last year uh, in changing some laws about, you know, advertising uh, on, on Facebook and also uh, publishing news articles and so on. But the response of Facebook was, uh, by, by the organisation, was quite uh, significant because the organisation does have without a doubt, a lot of power. Uh, Sorry, you about to say something? Yeah, no, I was just going to say that it's, um, you know, your, what you say is right in that there's this kind of broad trend towards Mm. kind of increased government regulation and accountability that's absolutely essential. Mm. Um, But I suppose the plea that I would make is that, um, is not to forget those countries where social media can do the most harm. Right. Yeah. Because kind of from a Western policy perspective, it becomes a really introverted discussion in mm. that everyone's sort of focused on, OK, how can this undermine what's happening in Australia or the US yeah. or the UK or Germany? And all of that is incredibly important, of course. But I guess my retort to that is if you think it's bad there, yeah. come to Libya, come to the Philippines, come to Cameroon, and then you will get a real sense of how a sort of unbridled social media space, how bad that can be, right? And in the whole debate around the harms that social media are doing to to our societies, it tends to be focused on kind of defending democracy, Mm. right? And of course, I come with the bias of where I'm sitting and working, where the places where we are, there's not necessarily a democratic government. There might not even be a government at all. 
Um, and, and you're all trying to focus on something perhaps even more fundamental than democracy, which is people's just basic peace and, and right mm. to live mm. without violence. So I would really like to see that be a bigger part of the debate on how the platforms change and, and be regulated. A hundred percent. And we also forget, again, from our quote-unquote privileged positions uh, in wealthy countries where we have other sources of information, you know, but there are countries and I, and I, and I spent some time in Iraq not long ago and I, I was absolutely blown away to realize that everything happens on Facebook in Iraq. Yes. Everything, everything. I mean, all the emotions I experienced through Facebook. Uh, mm. It is a the principal medium through which information is shared between people from one side of the country to the other and from, you know, the government down, etc. which, you know, we don't give that much thought because we have, you know, other sources of uh, information. But there are countries, like you say, where there is no institutional support uh, and this is filling a gap, a vacuum, uh, and not necessarily leading to the outcomes that the organizations would like to uh, exactly. uh, propose. Uh, but maybe, uh, uh, and, and conscious of the time, and uh, you've been very gracious with it, but maybe to to start heading towards the, the, the kind of end of our discussion, but also maybe something positive. I'm sure that there sure. are positive aspects of technology, so social media to the work that you do and the work that HD does, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, th there's um, a whole world of kind of, they call it peace tech, where the, there's a large community of people, not just in HD, but, but in the rest of our kind of peace peacemaking community who are um, who are really experimenting a lot right now and, and trying to see exactly what's possible. Because, you know, while I think our main focus is at, at HD is focusing on mitigating the downside risks, right? The threats. Mm. Um, absolutely, there's a kind of huge positive potential for uh, to harness technology, right? And for mm. mediators to be savvier about that. Because I think as an industry, we're not really known for being um, technologically savvy, right? Mm. Mm. Um, and so we're kind of playing catch up, I feel, to a, to a lot of other industries. But it, it's, it, it's really the, the level of interest now has, has surged. And, and we are beginning to, I think, build the evidence base for, for what works and what doesn't. Mm. And in particular, you know, we spoke earlier, Maz, about how technology can be used for, for inclusion uh, in a mm. peace process. And, and that's really where, where there's a huge amount of potential, you know. And, and in, in Libya, it's, it's been quite well documented there, the, the UN's efforts um, to, you know, reach out through different tools, to for kind of digital assemblies almost right mm. um and and to complement the work that they were doing in the negotiating room with 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 outreach to the public at large and you know on our side at, at hd there's a number of kind of pilot projects which we're running kind of focusing on digital citizens assemblies for example mm. you know in the mm. philippines we're running work in in sudan engaging the diaspora um we're trying to to support clubhouse discussions in Yemen and the the point of all of that is to bring people into a conversation um, who might otherwise be excluded from from a negotiation process and not for the sake of it but because their support is going to be essential for for the legitimacy of any agreement so I I, I think that there's a huge amount that that can be done and and um and you do see that people are really willing to engage because you, you can't always bring people into a, a meeting room, but you can mm. quite easily reach them on, on Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp. And, and we're silly if we don't take advantage of those opportunities. And you can have Zoom meetings, right? I mean, it, it might sound uh, uh, funny, but I suspect over the past year, you guys would have become uh, quite, uh, <laughs> <laughs> quite good at that, at holding mediations uh, over Zoom. Definitely. You, you try to. Like, I think there's a certain set of conversations where, especially if you know people already, mm. okay, sure, you, you, you can hop online with them and it works. Uh, a little more challenging when, when you're in the early stages of, uh, of, of kind of building trust with people. Then, you know, So, yeah, I have quite a long list of places where I, I think I'll probably need to head to in person now that kind of pandemic restrictions are easing just because they're not the sort of people who hop on Zoom. <laughs> of course, yeah. Oh, I'd imagine. And, and e restrictions easing uh, maybe for uh, the rest of the world, but certainly not for us uh, in Australia. No, sure. Which, <laughs> which, uh, which uh, I know the, the rest of the world is watching and uh, perhaps shaking their head. I'm not quite sure. Mm. Um, 
Adam, on that note, it's been an absolute pleasure, mate. I take my hat off to you and the organization for what you do. I think I've had the pleasure of uh, knowing some people in the organization and having some outsiders' insights into uh, some of the work that you do. And I've, of course, followed your work uh, and the organization's work over the years uh, and, of course, your podcast. So uh, congratulations on everything you do and uh, good luck with the the small challenge of uh, dealing with digital (laughs) content thanks so much Maz I really enjoyed the conversation thanks for joining us for another episode of The Voices of War you can access all episodes on www.thevoicesofwar.com or by subscribing wherever you get your favourite podcasts and while you're there please give us a review as we'd love to hear what you think if you'd like to recommend a guest for the show you can reach me on info at thevoicesofwar.com. 